Hello, everybody, and welcome to Channel 781 News. Um, this week in Waltham, there were people collecting signatures for a ballot initiative having to do with uh, undocumented immigrants, and there was a protest against that and some controversy, so we'll tell you about that. The uh, Rules and Ordinances Committee had another special summer meeting to talk about pot shops, so we'll update you on that. Um, and uh, this is going to be tonight the first of our arts focused episodes over the summer. Um, we would like to use the time we have while the city council is not meeting regularly to uh, talk more about the arts in Waltham. Um, if you want your community to be a welcoming place, um, a place where people are engaged and feel like home, it's, it's important to follow local politics, but it's also important to follow local arts because it is artists who play a big role in making a place welcoming, making a place diverse, and uh, determining how we use and how we perceive our public spaces. So tonight we're gonna profile two um, local artists for you. One of them is here with us and that's Luke Schumacher. Hello, Luke. Hi, how's it going? Hi, uh, Luke is a young writer who recently had a book published. Um, so we'll hear more about that. And then Chris also has a profile for us of Spectacle, um, who is another artist in the community. So we'll tell you more about him as well. Um, before we do that, let's talk about community events. So the Waltham Lions Club has a carnival coming up Wednesday, July 27th through third, um, Sunday, July 31st. Um, that's the only one-off event we know about, but the farmer's market is ongoing. The uh, Waltham Arts Council Summer Concert Series is ongoing. Um, free Zumba on the Common Wednesday evenings. Waltham Trail Runners are doing meetups. Um, so you can find details and links to all of those things on the Waltham Reddit. And uh, two or meetings I should mention. One is tomorrow night, Wednesday night, depending on when you're watching this, the Zorn, uh, Zoning Board of Appeals is meeting. That was a, a notice that just recently went up on the bulletin board. Um, so I wanted to let people know about that. And also Councillor Paz is organizing a meeting of people who are concerned about immigrant justice here in Waltham. Um, that is a, a pre-sign up type of thing. So just contact Councillor Paz if you're interested in that. And um, so that is community events. Oh, I also wanted to mention that um, if you went to Pride, you probably did not get one of these Pride t-shirts because we sold out really quick. They are now available for sale online finally, thanks to the efforts of Chris and um, our good friend Blessing Arijo and the, Chris, can you remind me the name of the artist who's printing the shirts? Um, his name is Matt from Waltham, good friend of mine. Okay. He, uh, and, he, runs, he runs the printing press under uh, the name Black Mold Market. Right on. So you can find, uh, we'll put a link to the store site um, or you can find it, it's, it's Blessing's online store, which is called How to Be Human Shop. You might have seen her at Pride or at um, uh, Juneteenth and she is helping us sell these. Um, so check that out. Um, so now that that all is done, I want to go to Chris to introduce us to Luke. Perfect. Um, so yes, uh, today we're joined by Luke Schumacher, a 14 year old McDevitt student who just recently published his first novel uh, titled, It's Only a Headache. Um, I finished reading my copy a couple of weeks ago, uh, but even before that, we knew that we wanted to have Luke on the show. I think it's a great thing uh, that has happened. Um, so how are you doing, Luke? Um, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, so first, do you want to chat a little bit about what this book is about um, for the people that haven't read it, including my uh, two co-hosts? Yeah, um, so it's basically about, um, it's a little hard to explain, as you can probably tell after reading it, but it's sort of about this boy who gets like some kind of curse placed on him. And this curse gives him like awful headaches and visions and nightmares. So um, he basically tries throughout the whole book to get rid of these with like the help of his friends. And it has some elements of like realistic fiction while some elements of like science fiction or fantasy. So it kind of, it's kind of a combination of a lot of different genres. Uh, so we wanted you on because uh, this is a huge feat to accomplish. I'm sure many other people have the relatable experiences I do of taking on writing at a young age, just like you. Um, you know, I've, I've written short stories and many different projects, but none of them ever like, you know, came to fruition and you didn't abandon this project. You uh, published a more than 350 page book at age 14. And uh, so, 
Can you talk a little bit about the publishing part? It's not only about writing the, the 350 pages, it's about putting a book together and putting it out into the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, publishing it was one of the most interesting parts I think about doing it. Like there was a lot of research I had to do about like how self-publishing works and things like that. Um, like a lot of people assumed I went out and got an agent, but I decided to take a route called self-publishing where you basically have to do a lot of the work by yourself. So like it took a lot of different steps. Like I had to get an editor, I had to get a cover designer. Um, I had to like buy like the barcode slash ISBNs, things like that. So it wasn't cheap, it wasn't easy, but it was really rewarding once it was all done. Oh, that's amazing. Um, how has the response been so far? Um, it's been really positive actually. Um, I've um I made some posts about it on like Instagram and TikTok and things like that. And like um people were so impressed by it. Like I'm pretty sure one of the videos got twenty six thousand views. Wow. Um and um that was insane. And some of the messages and comments I got after that were really heartwarming. Like um I saw some people being like um, oh, you inspired me to keep writing my book, or I'm going to do this now. And I talked to a bunch of sixth grade classes from my school near the last couple of weeks. And like one of my teachers came up to me and was like, a bunch of my students are now wanting to write their own books or are starting their own books. And it's like, it was just, it was really like inspiring to see that. That's awesome. That's exactly what you want to hear. Um, speaking of classes, how has the uh, Waltham education system helped you in writing this book? Um, I had two really good teachers who helped me throughout it. Um, like they both, <clears throat> one of them um, let me like stay after school and work on it there. And we even started like a writing club at our school together. And um, the other one like read the entire thing and gave me advice. And we also just talked about like literature a lot and like how it works in different ways and things like that. So they're both really helpful. Um, do, you, do you want to name drop them? Yeah, um, the first one that I mentioned was named um, Miss Hershon, and the second was named Miss Whipple. Um, and when I got interviewed by the news for um, Channel Five, um, they both like came on with me, so that was really fun. That's awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so sexuality plays a central role in one of the characters in your story, and it's mentioned uh, several times throughout the book. Can you talk about why it was important for you to put a spotlight uh, on that struggle? Yeah, well, um, I'm gay myself, so, um, and a problem I sort of had while growing up is that there wasn't a lot of, like, representation for those things while growing up. Like, it's not really seen as the norm. Um, and, like, it's getting better these days, but, like, um, I've noticed that a lot of young kids are probably going to be reading the book. So um, I want them all to feel represented in different ways. Um, so that's one way I thought was really important by giving, like, the representation that was needed for that. Absolutely. It's inspiring. Um, just a uh, last question. Uh, Waltham is not known for being an artist city, uh, but we have a small thriving community of artists. Um, I asked this to Spectacle as well, who um, you'll see in this video as well. Um, do you have any ideas for how you think we can do, uh, we as a city, municipally and a, at a cultural level, um, be doing better uh, to center the arts in uh, our city? Mm -hmm. Um, well, there's there's a lot of talented people in Waltham, I've noticed. Like, a couple of the kids I've met at my school, like, they'd also have big endeavors and stuff. And, like, they, they didn't see them as, like, really big, but, like, they, they were really cool. So mm -hmm. it's, like, I think some kind of, like, spotlight program or, like, student art program, student spotlight program, things like that could be great for, like, incorporating, like, those things into the town. We reached out to the first, um, what was it, the first news thing I did with the patch. But after I got that, then the channel five news came to me and then you guys came to me. So it's like, I got lucky here with a lot of people approaching me, but like, it's not the same for everyone. So I think some kind of program for like boosting people up like that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are tons of people just like you that have these projects. And uh, unlike you, they just abandon the projects because they don't think it's worthwhile. Uh, but there are tons of worthwhile projects in the world just because you're 14 doesn't mean they're not important. You should stick with your projects, complete them, and put them out into the world. And uh, there are people that want to see them. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, this has been great, Luke. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, what is next for you, Luke Schumacher, published novelist? Well, um, a lot of people have asked that, and I, I'm just as like confused about it as everyone else is. Like, um, I finished my first stage play recently. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was really fun. I, I'm really into theater, so writing a play was something new, but I really loved doing that. Um, and 
I don't know. I've always wanted to write like a musical and things like that. Um, so I might try that. Um, I I don't plan to write a sequel for this book. I just don't think it warrants one. Um, it doesn't. Um, I might someday, but at the at this point, I don't really see like I could use one. But I definitely want to do a lot more writing, and I've done that already, like with like some writing contests and things like that. Oh, that's awesome, Luke. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, thanks so much for letting me come on. Of course. This would be right. great. Thank have you a great me. afternoon. Thank you. you. And we have a lot of really smart uh, kids in this city. Yeah. And, yeah. And um, I, that was really great. I, that was a great interview. Sorry, I'm just catching up because that kind of caught me off guard. And so we have a, spec, a profile of another artist for you who is very appropriate to be part of our first art show because this is an artist who you probably have not heard of, but you're definitely familiar with his work because he is the artist who has put up uh, vinyl records with abstract designs painted on them on uh, telephone poles and other places all around the city. His name is Spectacle and Chris is gonna tell us more about him. Okay, everyone, we're here on the Waltham Commons uh, with our concerts on the common that run every week during the summer. Uh, we're joined by Spectacle, uh, local character and gorilla artist. How you doing, Spectacle? Groovy. Perfect. Uh, so, as an artist, I'm sure you create through many different mediums, but you're locally famous in Waltham for your colored discs that you leave in public places. Uh, can you tell us how you got started with that? Well, first of all, the discs are 33 and a third records from between the 1960s to the 1980s. That's actually, they're pressed to this very day. We just don't see them because it's from days long ago, but they, they, they do still exist. And that's what I use for most of my discs that uh, I put up around town and sometimes in Watertown and sometimes in Arlington and Lexington and Belmont. So how did you get started with that? I had a cache of box records and I didn't know what to do with them and being a painter and an artist i had a wealth of all sorts of different kinds of paints and mastics from spray paints to acrylics to oil paints to pastels and i just decided to start exercising my right to put them down wherever i want and i put them down on records and and then i was left with a bunch of painted records and I said what better thing to do with them than to put them on telephone poles strictly telephone poles never on trees ever never never anywhere else but on telephone poles and I just started doing it and it caught on and some people loved it and some people hated it and here I stand today with my friend Chris and you said uh, just recently that you did, you've done over 3,000 of these? I painted more than 3,000 records. Uh, at least 1,700 of them have been taken down from telephone poles from people who enjoy them and dissenters and people who want to collect them and people who want to throw them in the garbage and people who want to smile at them and people who want to frown at them and people who want to take them into their house and hang them in their backyard. And mm -hmm. I'm cool with anything that anybody wants to do with them as long as it incites, as long as it excites, mm -hmm. as long as it inspires. And when they look on the back, it's especially groovy, I think, when a kid looks on the back and, see, and sees the album, the, the label, Sergio Mendez. And, and seeing as there's no secrets anymore when it comes to anything on the phone you just ask the box mm -hmm. and they say hey, who's Sergio Mendez and all of a sudden a seven-year-old an eight-year-old and 12-year-old is listening to Lonely Bull and a whole new generation is rediscovered and it's absolutely fabulous and I wouldn't have it any other way that kind of goes into my next question what has the response been from citizens and businesses and uh, when was the first one you did in Waltham first ones that I did, I started around, um, around Main Street, and they were taken down by the city department. What year? 
uh, about four years ago. Oh, four, that's it? Three thousand solid years. Yeah, Three thousand in four years. That's crazy. Years. Very, very stalwart. Been working with my, my, my nose to the grindstone at this project. And, and they were taken down by the city workers. And I got a knock at my door and a city worker was there with my records and they handed them back to me. He said, you can't do this. And I was tickled pink. So I continued doing it. <laughs> and here we are today with all my friends and all the people who are going to show up here on the common and 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 uh so you kind of already answered this next question but you know i've had friends that have said like you know i love those uh records uh that just hang up and i want to like take one uh but i don't know if like the artist is okay with that can you tell us the official spectacle policy unofficial all the way it is it's freelance it's do with it what you will Sometimes when they do nights here on the common, I like to walk around with some records and just put them on the ground mm. and let people pick them up and, and wonder and say, what's going on here? And take them and maybe throw them away. But I think that most people don't and maybe take them home and, and maybe not cherish them because that's a little bit too flamboyant, but appreciate them. Mm. And, and I give them to their grandchildren. I've had people say, can I have a special, I've had people, auctions hmm. uh, for the boys club uh, right now I'm hung in Waltham City Hall with a whole I'm sorry in in the in the Waltham Public Library with a whole bunch of different forms of the records and when it comes to taking them down it is it, it's a free-for-all if I put them up they're pretty much public knowledge public information public property and nothing i can do about it mm -hmm. but unfortunately my time on the telephone poles is coming to a close because my need and desire for vinyls my need and desire for vinyls is coming to a close i can't get any more wow. and i don't know what to do so maybe this might help drum up a little bit of uh some uh, uh i don't know some anything a, few, a couple boxes a moldy a moldy box of records in your grandparents basement i could dig anything that you anything that you could throw my way spectacle spectacle that's my handle um what do you have to say to folks uh the, that aren't your biggest fans that say you feeling entitled to put your art on public property is a slippery slope to confiscating private property for the public good without artists there are no critics. Without critics, there are no artists. Anything goes, as long as nobody's getting hurt. And maybe some somebody might have their feelings bruised, or they might feel that it's me taking liberties, but nobody's getting hurt. And, and like I said, it makes the kids happy. They, they go on the lookout. I hear from different schools. I, I, I'm in the know with a bunch of different people in the hierarchy here on Waltham, which is a real big pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of feedback and uh, it's, a, it's an absolute pr privilege. It's a privilege and an honor to do what I do. Unfortunately, like I said, my time is coming to a close and I have to uh, drum up some more vinyl business. Hear me now, help me people. I need vinyl. <laughs> Um, so, last question. Uh, Waltham isn't known for being an artist city, but we really do have a thriving community of artists within uh, the city, if you know where to look for them. What can we as a city do uh, on a municipal level, as well as a cultural level, to really uh, do a better job of um, putting a spotlight on art artistry? All you artists and wannabe artists, this is your platform right here on the common Tuesday nights Waltham concerts on the common we're uh, we're looking for artists we need artists I'm it, me and my and my mom and a couple other people with it we're like the only artists and I've tried to drum up people and interest but it doesn't seem that people you know people everybody wants to be world famous and, and in the Louvre but they don't want to put their head out there mm -hmm. so Put your head out there, people. That's what we need. We need. We need. We need. We need all this expanse filled. It's it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, go go to Global Thrift. Talk talk to Cindy up on Moody Street. 
and, and I know she wouldn't mind me giving her name. I've got oodles of art hanging on the walls up there, lots of records, lots of painted clothes. And never mind me, there's so much other art behind me and in, in, in front of me in hanging on the walls at, at, at Global Thrift. It's such an opportunity. Everything is an opportunity mm -hmm. if you just go out and seize the day. Seize the day. You got to do it. You're not going to get anywhere if you don't. And you know what? Sometimes you're going to get turned out flat and it's going to hurt. But get back up. Dust yourself off. Start all over again. Well, that's a wonderful spectacle. I hope you enjoy your concerts on the Common. Okay, Chris, thank you very much for connecting with Spectacle and getting us that report. Um, so moving on to another news item, but it also, uh, uh, I'm going to try to tie it into an arts item. So the rail trail, we've talked to you before about um, the rail trail in Waltham is an old railroad that goes all the way from Westin to um, Belmont and um, the city has decided to develop it. And I believe work has begun on it. I saw construction equipment on the section near Market Basket. I may be wrong because sometimes they've used that area as storage for other projects, but I'm pretty sure this was the actual rail trail work going on. So that's exciting. And the other news since we talked about it last is that the city got a grant of half a million dollars from the state um, to rebuild the Linden Street, Street Bridge. That's the kind of uh, old rusty railroad bridge you see over Linden Street near the Belmont line or sort of on the way to Belmont and Watertown. And um, the rail trail goes over that. So if you've ever tried walking it, you can't safely go over that bridge. So you have to kind of climb down into the street and climb back up. So now that will be um, restored. So that means the rail trail can eventually connect to Belmont which means it'll eventually connect to Cambridge and Boston and it can be a commuter um, trail. Uh, it will also eventually connect to Weston. That requires a bridge over Route 95, but from what we understand, the developers of the 1265 Main Street project have committed to build that bridge. So that should happen eventually. So that's very exciting. Um, another piece of news is the library announced that they're once again doing their graffiti camp this summer. This is a program um, for youth. Um, and the, they did it last year. It seems really cool. I, I'm happy to hear they're doing it again. Um, so that might be kind of a provocative title, Graffiti Camp, because uh, earlier this year, the Waltham police did a series of Facebook posts on different kinds of common crimes. And they, they made it very clear that graffiti is a crime. Um, but uh, so I, what I want people to know about this camp is that it's taught by someone who is a very well-respected mural artist, um, Cedric Douglas, who goes by Vice One or Vise One. I'm not sure how you say it online. Um, he is the um, teacher of this. And I wanted to uh, share my screen for just a moment. Didn't the police use the Berlin Wall as an example of why graffiti is bad? I think they copied from Wikipedia, which used the Berlin Wall, and they just used that picture without thinking about it, which, yes, it, that Iconic. was an interesting, interesting Legendary. thread on Facebook. They also mentioned that uh, graffiti can be a cult, which some people thought sounded like a flashback to the 80s, um, satanic panic. But I mean, technically, yes, graffiti can be a cult. That doesn't mean you have to be <laughs> afraid of it. But anyways, here, this is a piece of work um, by Cedric Douglas. Um, I just wanted to give one example. If you look him up online, there's tons more. But the point here is he does really professional um, looking nice murals. And I wanted to show this because I think some people perceive maybe that murals in a neighborhood kind of make it look cheap. And this is not cheap looking work. Um, there's a lot of communities in Massachusetts, including Lowell, Cambridge, Boston, that have gone out of their way to bring in mural artists because it adds a lot to the community. So I wanted to tie that into the rail trail because uh, if you walk the rail trail now, you'll see it goes by the backs of many, many buildings that are basically blank for lack of a better word. So once the rail trails developed, it, those will be very easy targets for graffiti. And the danger there is that um, that could cause the business owners not to support the rail trail or the police not to support it. It actually goes right by their station, um, which could then maybe discourage the town from continuing to develop it. 
um, which the other option might be for this community to fund mural artists to come in and do murals along the rail trail, um, which would uh, cut down the graffiti. There are some people who will tag on a mural, but most people don't. So murals do cut down graffiti and also could be something really cool. Um, so that's how I tie, tie uh, the graffiti camp um, back into that because it would be great to have some youth in Waltham um, who are trained in these skills who can either make or help somebody else to make some big murals for us. I think that could be a great thing um, for our city. And so moving on, uh, the Rules and Ordinances Committee had yet another special meeting this week about pot shops. Uh, James, can you fill us in on that? So it's been a series of meetings. Uh, the one right before they um, uh, before they adjourned for the summer was so waiting on like the final number coming back from the uh, the traffic commissioner and uh, the, that number is like in the order of like 350,000 to be split among all the applicants and there was a lot of back and forth on the implications of that and whether that counted towards the the uh, impact fund that was going to be negotiated from the city with the uh, and that's basically what was the content of the last two meetings that happened during uh, the summer session. And in addition to that, uh, this, the, the counselors, uh, Harris in particular, reassuring everyone that they're working as hard as they can on trying to get this done. They, 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 are mo they appear motivated at least to get this done. They wouldn't be meeting during the summer if they weren't. And the, it, it sounds like we're gonna be approaching some kind of conclusion to this. And there's a meeting scheduled for this August the 1st that is going to have all representatives from the uh, the dispensaries and the uh, expected to be better attended than the summer sessions were with counselors from uh, or from with counselors who are off committee and I expect to hear more of the more stuff from I expect that to be a lively meeting. Let's, uh, let's put it that way. Do you think that I didn't watch these uh, meetings? Thank God. Uh, do you think that they're going to give a permit out at that meeting? I, I don't want to make a prediction of, about what they're going to do at the like when they're going to actually issue this. It, it, the, the there is like some indication I've seen that there that there's like a state level like push to conclude these types of things. I. I'm not the person to ask about that, but it would make sense to me that like it isn't just you know us being present and recording them that's making them want to fast track this or move faster than they have in the past at least. There's got to be someone pressuring them. Yeah. So according to our friend Emily, who's also been following this closely, um, the state recently changed the laws regarding pot shops, and they, it allows. Um, the state to come in and if a city is not um, moving forward its process, um, the state can come in and take over the process. And I'm sorry, I can't give much detail on this. I, I uh, need to read up on it a little more, but it seems likely that the state has either threatened to do that or is doing that with Waltham because that would explain why they're meeting over the summer to get this taken care of. So we love to take credit for the fact <laughs> that they now want to move it forward by raising awareness of this. Um, but it seems likely that there is uh, something else going on here. Yeah, the uh, the stick probably is going to be something impacting the community host agreement, I would imagine. So they've got they, they're motivated at this point to get something done. I mean, just a reminder, we voted for this in 2016. New and got it done in like two years. And we're still just frigging talking about it. Crazy. I'm surprised we haven't been sued yet. One of the other things that came up too, uh, Kate's put in a letter for the last meeting, which was very much reflecting like NIMBY complaints. It was about specifically the um, uh, the the one on Main Street, I believe. Mm. Uh, and it, to tie it back to the rail trail, it did bring up that it's positioned close to the rail trail. It's positioned close to the rail trail might make it like a haven for like criminal activity or something. When like ironically like i would consider the problem with with where, where these dispensaries are ending up is that they're too tightly concentrated away from any transit at all and yeah so like it, it's it's interesting that the first push the first real pushback targeting one of them is like or I would say the first real pushback the by pushback targeting yeah yeah by a sitting counselor i'd say targeting one of them 
If people want to have a hate sure. for crime, why would they do it next to a building that's guaranteed to have high security? Yeah. He, to, to his credit, he did bring up that like the the community is like you know doesn't have a ton of parks and doesn't have a lot of green space and could be you know that like that, that is like a way to try to like get what you want in terms of like more uh, amenities for the people who live there. But like mm. it definitely feels like it's dog whistling too. This will entice people to go to parks. They will smoke weed and go to parks. <laughs> That's absolutely true. All right. Anything else on that before we move on? Um, so. August first. August first. August first is the the next one. The next one, and that's also when there's the special council meeting where they're. Oh yeah, it is part help. of the special uh, summer session meeting. We're yeah, gonna... so we'll have to keep an eye on that August first meeting. Um, mm -hmm. So our next thing to talk about, and I'm going to share my screen once again. This past weekend, this picture is from this past weekend. There were people collecting signatures at Market Basket for a ballot initiative. Um, so the state of Massachusetts, the legislature recently passed a law that allows undocumented immigrants to apply for driver's licenses. And the thinking behind this is that it makes everyone safer because if they apply, they take a road test, they go through all the same process as the rest of us. And in fact, law enforcement agencies, some law enforcement agencies, including Waltham PD, um, supported this idea because they thought it would reduce traffic stops. However, um, Governor Baker vetoed it. The legislature overrided the veto. The Massachusetts Republican Party immediately sued, um, went to the Supreme Judicial Court and lost. So now there is a ballot initiative um, to try to get a question on the ballot um, for this uh, election um, that would overturn that law and ban undocumented immigrants from having licenses. Um, this is being organized online by a group called Fair and Secure Mass. Um, but from reading up on it, it appears that it's mostly being organized by the Mass Republican Party. Jim Lyons, the chair of the party, um, is behind it. And many of the Republican candidates for office have participated in these signing events. Um, in this picture, you can see Jim Dixon, who's the chair of um, the Waltham Republicans, appear to be involved in organizing um, this one that happened this weekend, I went by to see what was going on um, because there had also been another collection um, a week ago, the prior weekend. And at that one, protesters arrived and they had signs that said, decline to sign, ask me why. So they were standing there with signs. People could choose to talk to them or could choose to go over to the signature table. Um, Councillor Paz was involved in organizing that. And on social media, on the Waltham Politics page, um, somebody named Molly Ferdinand, although the, the moderator, who's awesome, Elizabeth Lear, she's a really good moderator, and she pointed out this is probably a fake account. But anyways, this person was posting, um, kind of calling out, um, calling these group a left-wing mob, and basically saying they had used blocking and intimidation to prevent people from signing. And they posted a bunch of pictures that were supposed to support that, but they don't really support the idea that they were blocking or intimidating um, from what I could see. Jim Lyons, the head of the Republican Party, amplified this and called Councillor Paz a radical leftist. <laughs> so congratulations, Councillor Paz, on being called a radical leftist by the chair of the, the very far right chair of the um, Massachusetts GOP. Um, one of the people who was collecting signatures last week and also this week was David Kane, who's sort of a local um, politico. He shows up at a lot of political events in the Waltham, Watertown area. And he was one of the unmasked people who showed up at our school committee meeting about masks last fall. So uh, this organization posts a lot of pictures on their Facebook of their signings and people who have protested them, calling them blockers or intimidators. And this is actually one of the pictures they posted to make the point that they were being intimidating. So you, this was from Waltham, so you can judge for yourself how intimidating uh, these protesters are. This picture is maybe my favorite part of this whole story. Um, uh, Mrs. Arena was there also um, at this weekend's signing. Um, there were no protests this weekend, at least not during the time I was there. Um, there were people coming by who going into shop who were getting into, uh, there were a few arguments between shoppers 
and people who were um, helping with the signing. There were people who were there officially helping and then there were people hanging out like Mrs. Arena was just hanging out. Um, so there were a few confrontations, but no protests as far as I saw. One of the alarming things I saw this weekend though was one of the signature collectors was wearing a t-shirt for CORE, which is a far right group um, that uh, the Mrs. Arena is also involved with, um, but the CORE North was co-founded by Mark Sahady, who was arrested for his role in January 6th, and by other former co-founders of Super Happy Fun America, which is the far right group that organized some very contentious and in some cases violent events in Boston. So I went up to this woman and I said, can I ask you about your shirt? And she said, you already know what it is and you're just here to start trouble. And she told me if I didn't go away immediately, she'd have me arrested. She was also wearing, although you can't see it in my picture, she was also wearing a straight pride button that looked like it was from the straight pride event that Super Happy Fun America did back in 2019. So that's my picture. So I talked to um, some of the people who were there to try to get a better understanding of why they're doing this. Um, Councillor Paz, in response to people calling him a radical leftist and saying he was an intimidator, he released a very nice statement online that said the First Amendment is a two-way street. He also said in that statement that these people were using hateful language to talk about immigrants. Um, when I was there, I didn't hear them using slurs per se, but they kept using the word illegals. So I asked them a lot of questions about who they consider illegal. I asked about asylum seekers, are they illegal? Are migrant workers illegal? Are dreamers illegal? And um, got sort of, from some of them, very confusing answers to that. There was one person who had pretty precise answers to it and seemed to maybe sort of know what he was talking about. Um, and I, one of the reasons I asked them was because the Jeff Deal campaign had sent out a text blast where they attacked Maura Healy's campaign for hiring an undocumented person on their staff. And the person they're referring to is someone who was brought to this country as a kid and is now working here legally because of the DREAM Act. So I asked people, do you think that was okay to attack someone who's here legally? And um, they mostly said no, although they, at least two of them said they were Jeff Deal fans. Um, but one of them said, no, no, it's something about, you know, this is being abused. The fact that someone's here legally doesn't mean much. Um, but one important thing that all of the people I talked to agreed on, I asked a bunch of people if they'd comment on camera and nobody would comment on camera or give me their name. So that's why I'm not citing anyone. But all the people I talked to emphasized that the most important reason for this ballot initiative is because if undocumented immigrants have a driver's license, that means they can vote, which is false. A oh, driver's license didn't, doesn't give you the right to vote. So when I challenged them on that, they explained what they mean is, no, it doesn't give you the right to vote now, but inevitably the state will require um, driver's licenses for voting at some point. And at that point, um, it will become a problem. And in fact, one of the people I talked to believes that this is the motivation, that this is part of a plan by the Democrats in the legislature to they're setting up a plan to allow um, undocumented immigrants to vote illegally, make it easier for them to vote to illegally because they believe that's going to help them in politics. And so this effort, in addition to seemingly being about anti-immigrant sentiment, it is very much tied to the big lie idea, the big lie about the 2020 election and the, the belief that um, voter fraud is rampant and um, various states passing laws that are actually preventing people from voting in the interest of supposedly increasing uh, voter safety. So I don't think it's likely Mass is going to pass a law um, that requires driver's licenses to vote. And I think this aspect of their campaign is very misleading. Um, so it seems to me this effort um, is based largely on bigotry and on right-wing conspiracy theories. And so I sent in my pictures to Walt M. Night's Watch, and they've also been posting about it. If you want to learn more info, background on there, you can check Walt M. Night's Watch on Twitter. Um, and it, this organization said they were going to be coming back here to do these signings every Monday, Thursday, and Friday at Waltham Market Basket from four to seven. 
Um, so you, if you want to talk to them, you can go talk to them. You cannot block them or intimidate them, but you can talk to them. And if you hear them using hateful language, you can report that to the store manager who can kick them out, regardless of what they tell you. The store manager does have the power to kick them out if they're being hateful. Um, but they just today published an updated list and that was not on there. So it's not clear if they've canceled the Waltham ones or if they're just not listing it. So if you do go on Thursday or Friday, um, let us know if you if you see them still there. Um, any comments on that, uh, Chris or James? Yeah, the point about uh, them being concerned about uh, eventually like that they'll be enacting like a driver's license, like a requirement to vote or something is like a slope. That's what? It's a slippery slope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's 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 funny because it's like usually that the, the usually the driver's license gets brought brought in to like drive down voter turnout and stuff, and now they're upset that it like might potentially be enabling other people to vote. And it's like maybe we shouldn't be like you know having <laughs> licenses to vote anyway. But um, I mean, I have many thoughts about this, but the biggest one uh, for me is that I have no idea why this is turning out to be such a big deal. Like this is grown adults being offended by not getting immediately what they want. The protesters are not radical leftists. They are inviting people to chat with them. Like they're not black blocking it up and flipping their table and tearing up their sheet. Like what is radical about what they're doing? Why? I don't understand why. Well, yeah. yeah, I don't it's understand. Why they're, they're, they're definitely telling on themselves and they're, they're telegraphing that that's what they want to have happen to them, you know, not necessarily <laughs> that's what is happening, you know. So and desperately they're... want to be oppressed. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that brings up a good point, which is that people who are very conservative don't have a lot of experience with with doing things that feel wrong socially, with being social actors, you know what I mean? So often when they have an opinion and someone disagrees with them, they feel like they're being censored because they're not used to actually being censored. And um, so you saw that a little bit in the way these folks reacted to protesters who were not very scary, but they, they acted, you know, um, they were really on edge. And, and this is maybe an advantage <laughs> that, we, that, that people on the left have because we're used to dealing with being socially <laughs> disliked by somebody. And in fact, for those who don't know, um, the, the neo-Nazi who lives in Waltham, um, Liam McNeil, he actually, he was at UMass Lowell and he said he refused to leave and they said they couldn't expel him. And then later he dropped out due to social pressure. He couldn't handle going to school with people who didn't like him because he was a Nazi. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes the ability to uh, not care about being disagreed with or called out as weird in public can be a, a big advantage uh, for those of us who are not uh, fascists or reactionaries. Any other comments on that? All you right. Did, you did it. Thanks for going there. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm glad I went by. There was also a reporter from WCAC there. So hopefully they'll be writing something about it. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens. It looks like they'll come back and there could be no protests. So we'll see how it develops. So thank you, everyone. That was a really cool episode. We hope to do a few more episodes that focus on arts in town while continuing to keep you up on other kinds of news over the summer. So we will see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>